Um, good morning again. Yeah, today we are starting um, a new series, and it's on Colossians, Jesus at the center of it all. You know, last year, September and October, we did a spiritual emphasis campaign. Who can remember what that spiritual emphasis campaign was called? What did we do last year? 40 days in the Word. And, and, and we got a tagline um, that was really the focus of what, of what we were seeking to do. And, and we found that it is important um, that we learn to love the Word, to learn the Word, and to live the Word. The Word of God is something that we are called to live. God's Word is living. It is powerful. It speaks to us today just as it spoke to the early disciples 2,000 years ago. Even before that, God's Word was, was making an impact in people's lives, and it is a Word for living. Um, the Bible says in, in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The purpose of the Bible is to help you to live out the purpose of God, to understand what God wants and to do it, to actually fulfill the things that God has for your life, the plans that he has for your life. God wants you to be thoroughly equipped so that you're not lacking in anything. You have everything that you need to take on life and to make a difference within life. And the way that God gets you ready for life, his purpose is through the scriptures. He teaches us so much in the scriptures. And from that passage, we learn that it, it does four things for us. It teaches, it rebukes, it corrects, and it trains us. You know, teaching is, is God showing you the path that you're supposed to be walking on. The rebuke comes when you've stepped off the path into the ditch. And, 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 and you know, God is showing us that you're off and you're, you're, you're walking into trouble. Correcting is how I get back to the path of life. How I get back to God's path so that I'm, I'm living his way. And training in righteousness is how I stay on that path so I don't keep on falling off into the ditch um, and crashing out in, in, in many different ways in our lives. The Word of God is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And God's Word is wonderful, and we learn so that we can live. You know, so we should love it, we should learn it, and we must live it. And this week and over the next two months, we're going to be focusing on a specific letter, the letter um, of Paul to the Colossians, the church in Colossae. And my prayer is that you'll not just wait, be waiting for Sunday to hear the person that is going to speak to you, but you will spend time in the scriptures. That the things that we learned during 40 days in the Word, I know that some of you might not have been here during that time, but you know, especially all of us who were here during that time, that you will pick up um, the things that, that, that you were taught and you'll start using it that you will probe the Word of God and try and find out new things as you interact with it, um, as you study it with the different methods. I know that a number of the community life groups are going to be also working together with us in this study of Colossians. That will enrich our time as you are reading it, as you are studying it, and as you are hearing the Word from the person that is up here, it will enrich your time and your growth because this Word is living and active and it transforms, it transforms our lives. Now coming to this letter, Colossae in its background was a city that was located in what is today Turkey. The church in Colossae had been started not by Paul but by a man named Epaphras who is mentioned a few times in this, in this particular letter and was with Paul at the time um, of the writing of this letter. Uh, Paul was in prison. We're not sure whether Epaphras himself was imprisoned or he was just in Rome and, and, and being with Paul in that situation. It seems that they had had reports of false teachings and false practices and ideas were starting to enter and contaminate, affecting the Christians in that city. Some of it related to, you know, Jewish traditions like the Sabbath and, and the new moon festivals and the kinds of food that you are allowed to eat and you must never eat. You know, some of it related to other kinds of philosophies. It talks about human ideas that really look good and they really look wise but ultimately are not the path and the, and the calling of God. And Paul's solution to this particular thing as he writes to these people 
Um, and it's a solution that he's giving to us as, as a people who want to live good lives that reflect God's presence in us, reflect the faith that we have. It's very simple, it is very consistent, and it runs through the whole letter. You know, our faith is all about Jesus Christ, the man in whom the presence of God dwells in its fullness. You know, the Christ who was crucified um, for our salvation and who guarantees our eternity. The Christ that we are living for today and all creation was made for him. And, 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 and he, so he tells us to fix Jesus. Put, put Jesus in the middle of everything. And as you see it, as you, as you go through this, you'll keep on coming back to the Christ, to what Jesus is and what he means and the, and the centrality of Jesus in everything. And the call that we have is to fix Jesus at the center of everything. If he's at the center of everything, you won't go wrong. And so the title of the series that we are having is Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. And we've broken it down into eight sections. Um, today, you know, what God wants is disciples. And, and, and we are looking at Paul's prayer um, for disciples. Um, the incomparable Christ next week, he is supreme. Then we look at the Christian minister, a person that's empowered to serve. Do not be deceived because these people were being deceived. You know, how do you get to the place where you're walking in the right way? Um, and we, 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 we will be looking at living with heaven in view. You know, how do we live with the knowledge that eternity is our home? And, and Christians in the home and in the workplace. In chapter 3, verse 18 to 4, 1. We then break for Easter. There will be Good Friday and, and Easter Sunday services. And then um, the next week, we'll look at chapter 4. Um, the first part, pray and then reach out. Because this is the calling that we want to be getting and bringing in new people. And then verse, verse 7 to the end, you find that Paul is talking about people. He writes down so many names. And it's a reminder to us that this is about people. This is about people. So let's dive in. Let's dive in. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus. By the way, you, you open your Bible in Colossians. We will be coming back to a number of the, of the passages that we're going to read. So you can just keep, keep your Bible open there. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen? It's a powerful word, isn't it? Now the body of this message really begins in, the, in, in verse 3 of chapter 1. But there was something in the greeting that catches my attention. In verse 2, Paul writes to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. As Paul is, is, is thinking about the people that he's writing to, what does he have? What does he see? What is the picture of them that he has in his mind? You know, he is seeing people who are holy. He sees people who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. And by the way, the word faithful here refers to people who have believed in Jesus and set their lives on him. You know, it's not based on the works that they have done in terms of being perfect adherents of, of the teaching of the Bible, of, you know, knowing every righteous thing that needs to be done. It is based on their faith, 
on their belief in the completed work of Jesus. Remember that these are people who were being infected with all kinds of false teaching and practices. And, and if you were in that situation, you might have wondered if he should really be addressing these people as followers of Christ at all. Because the kind of stuff they were doing was not really what was supposed to be done. But despite the weakness he has learnt about, he still refers to them as both holy and faithful. He's not ignoring their errors. No, his love for them could not allow this. And so he speaks into it. But he starts by letting them know that he accepts them fully as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, after all, having believed, they are accepted by God and they have become members of the family of Christ. You know, to be honest, this is, this is one area that, that I have struggled in in the past and I find many Christians struggling in this. I hope that I'm better now, but, but it's a real thing. And there are times that, you know, one must, might slip backwards and, 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 and find ourselves looking at other Christians, looking at other groups of people and condemning them because maybe their doctrine isn't quite right. You know, they've got some stuff, some, some errors there. You know, they're doing some practices that don't quite measure up. You know that church, what they do? They do this and this and, you know, they're not as good as us. Or you've learned about a sin that they've committed. Uh, and, 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 you know, you've learned maybe about conflicts that they're involved in and, and, the, and, and the wars that might be there. Maybe with you, personally, you might have been touched by it. And, and, and somehow you, you look at these people and you start, you know, you start actually looking, them as, looking at them as though they were not Christians at all. You know, some of us look down on other Christians because of their denominations. You know, one of the things I'm very glad about as I'm working with other churches and with other church leaders and, and also with you as people is, is a thing that has changed in the world that Christians are now able to walk across denominations. And it's such a great thing because it wasn't always true. We would look at that denomination and say, hey, we're not even sure that they are Christians. But now there seems to be a growing um, recognition that we are ultimately one family. You know, Jesus has accepted those people. He has accepted them. He died for them. And so Paul accepts them. And, and he uses this as a basis for speaking life into them and, and truth into their lives. Shouldn't we do the same? Shouldn't we also accept and use that as a means that we can speak truth into people's lives? You know, Jesus said in, in John 13, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So this is a new command. It is so important that there, it's a command and then Jesus actually repeat, repeats and he says, You must love one another. It is really, really important. And if you don't love one another, it won't show the world anything. You know, we won't be indicating our lives will not show that we are followers of Jesus Christ. This is important. In fact, in verse 4 of, of, of our passage in Colossians chapter 1, Paul refers to their love of other believers and it's clearly to him it's a sign that they are genuinely part of the body of Christ. They are truly followers of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 15, verse 7, the Bible says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. You know, with all the different flavors that we are, we are God's family. We are a family of God. And we accept each other. We grow together. We serve Christ with Him at the center. And as we do this, as we accept one another, this produces praise of God. People see, as Jesus said, that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. He is at the center. It's so important that we accept one another. The next thing that Paul says is, is a benediction. He says, grace and peace to you from God the Father. It's one of the things that Paul does. You know, we tend to do benedictions at the end. His benedictions always seem to come at the beginning of, of the letter, and, but also he puts one at the end. But when you look at grace and peace, this is what we need. This really is what we need. We need grace because we don't deserve anything good from God. We need grace because we fall, because we fail, because we forget, 
we, we need grace because we don't always do what God wants us to do. Even when we know what we should be doing, we don't do it. And we need grace because the things that God has clearly said we should not do, we find ourselves still doing them. We need God's grace because we are sinners. And, and if we're looking for what we deserve from God, there's only one thing, it's only death. But the beauty of the relationship that we have with God is that He gives this grace to us. He gives us the forgiveness. It is a gift that He gives to us freely and it's favor and it's just an amazing thing that we have because we have Jesus Christ. That is grace and we need it and we need it. And as we have received it, we offer it to each other as Paul did. He shared his grace and he starts even with grace. And, and, and as we often do, at the end of our services, we often pronounce the benediction to each other as we say the grace to one another at the end of our services. The peace of God is something really deep. You know, it's not the absence of conflict in our lives. It's the peace that comes from a reassured knowledge, reassured knowledge of, of who we are in God. We have firm identity that we are okay, that we are valued and that we are secure, that what we have cannot be taken away. You know, it's not the peace that the world gives, which depends so much on the circumstances of life, the things that are going on around you. Do you have enough money? You know, do you, do you have the connections you need for this thing to happen? Is your health okay? Is there an absence? Is there no terrorism around so we don't have to worry about guards and going through all sorts of things? Rather, this is a peace that comes from God and it, dwell, it comes from the inside. And, and we'll be discovering more and more about this as we interact with Jesus and, and, and look at this letter to the Colossians. But we need that peace. Grace and peace from God the Father. Coming on as we enter into, the, into verse 3, we see that the first thing that Paul wants this community of people to know is that he prays for them. He prays for them, not just alone, but with others. Verse 3, we always thank God for the, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. It seems that Paul and his team met regularly for prayer. So what do, they, what do they do when they gather together to pray? They're giving thanks for the fruitfulness, the fruit of the gospel, for new people coming to faith, and they are praying for the strengthening and the fruitfulness of the saints, of those disciples, the new ones, and the ones who have been Christian for a longer time. They're praying that the followers of Jesus would become true to their, to their faith, that they will be fruitful disciples, which is what God wants, which is what God wants. You know, our staff team meets to pray every Tuesday. And, 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 and this is some of what we do as we pray. We are praying for you. Every Wednesday evening, we have a prayer service right here. So I invite you, come and pray. Come and pray. You know, we pray for our needs, but we also should be God-minded, like Paul and, and Timothy, who, who co-wrote this, this letter um, with him. God-minded when we pray. We're asking ourselves, what does God want? You know, he wants many, he wants everybody to become a Christian. He wants people to follow Christ, but he also wants Christians who are growing and they're becoming better and more fruitful and strong and effective as his agents here on earth. You know, true followers who share his identity now and will share his eternity. Paul and Timothy are God-minded as they pray. And, and I pray that you and I will learn to be God-minded in our prayers. The first part of the prayer is thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for other Christians. You know, Paul is thankful because of three things that he has heard about the, the Colossians, concerning the Colossians. Three things that we should be thankful for if they are in our lives. Faith, love, and hope. You know, these are the same three things that he mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, as the most important aspects of the Christian's life. These three remain. He says, faith, hope and love. Beyond the spiritual gifts, even powerful gifts like miracles and, 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 and prophecy and healings, these three gifts, these three gifts, they are the foundation. Faith, hope, and love. Do you have these three? Because you know, if you do, praise God. You know, thank God for, for, for what you have. If you, if you don't have them, you have nothing. You have really nothing from God, but with them, you have 
everything and everything else will follow and we thank God because they are a gift from God in fact even bringing us to salvation is God's work Jesus said in in John chapter 6 verse 44 he says no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day so yes you and I must respond obviously we must respond to to the invitation um, of God, the one who's reaching out to us, who's drawing us in. But when we respond, this is, this is just given to us. And, and, and Jesus says, he will keep us, you know, and, and raise us up in the last day. We, we have that guarantee. The giver of this gift is God himself. So three things. First is faith in the Lord Jesus. You know, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You know, we've been told something by God through his prophets, and we believe it. We've, we've been told that in Jesus Christ, we have life, not just for now, but for eternity. And we believe it. Not everybody believes it. But those of us who have believed, having this faith makes all the difference in the world. You know, my life is totally different. It's lived completely different because I know what God has offered me what God has guaranteed me. Those things that perhaps I'm not seeing right now, I know them for sure. Something that God has planted in me makes me so sure of what is coming. It's real. Praise God. Secondly is love. Love for the saints. And, and this is the mark of belief and following Jesus. We've already talked about that a little bit. You know, that, that you must love you know, the other people who share what you have. You know, if you don't love the saints, I wonder what you, you'll be doing. You know, how, how heaven will be for you, <laughs> you know? But the question might be, yet will I even go there? Will I even go there? Jesus says that the people will know that we are his disciples if we love one another. Yeah? God is love. God is love. And where there is no love, can we say that God is present? But thank God that even though we are not perfect, God has planted the seed of love in our hearts. That seed is there. It might not be perfect, but it's growing. And even the Colossians didn't have perfect love. That's why the, the false teachings were entering in. That's why they were being disturbed. But if we have love, we ought to thank God that who has showed us that ultimate love. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And our response to that love and all that we have been given by God is to have a love that then wells up inside us, a love that is for God, but also a love that results in a love for other people, especially for his family. These people are now our relatives. The third thing that we have there is that gift is hope. You know, a hope that is stored up for us in heaven. What is that hope? It is reported in the gospel, in the word of truth. And here are some of the things that we are hoping for. We are hoping for this ultimate salvation, an escape for judgment, because when the, when the day of judgment comes, you know, everybody will be being evaluated on what they've done. But then somewhere along the line, they'll open the book. There's a book that is opened, and if our name is on it, we're not being evaluated on whether we have sinned or not sinned. We have life. And that is, that is one of the things that we, we look forward to. We look forward to that eternal life that God gives to us. We are looking forward to the joy and fulfillment that is forever. Something that is beyond our dreams. That crown that, for example, Paul talks about. He's looking forward to receive a crown um, at the end of it. Now we are living already. As we, as we live in that hope, we are now living in eternity. Because God says if we have a relationship with him, if when Jesus said, you know, knowing Jesus, knowing God, this is eternal life. And so we start experiencing that even now as we are looking forward to that relationship with God forever in heaven. You know, the good news is that Jesus Christ died and he's now risen. And because of his death and resurrection, we can be sure that God's promises for his chosen ones will be fulfilled. The Bible tells us that all God's promises are yes in Christ. And so what should our response be? Amen. Yeah? You know that passage? Every promise of God, no matter how many promises he has made, are yes and amen in Christ. We have a hope that is far more than wishful thinking. It's founded and secured in the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
What does the gospel say? The gospel, the gospel is basically, you know, it starts by just saying, you know, first of all, all of us have sinned. It reminds us that this is the truth. We all sin and we've all fallen short of God's perfect glory. And the result is that the wages of sin is death. There's no other recourse. There's no other judgment than death. But Jesus came and died for us. And so he paid. He took the penalty for our sins and we are justified. We are made right with God. God looks at us and sees us as righteous. That's why Paul can say of us that you are the holy ones. Somehow because of Jesus we are holy. If our sin is paid for then the other thing that happens is that our relationship with God has changed and we become part of the family and, and we walk together with, with God the rest of our lives and into eternity. Jesus rising from the dead is part of the gospel and it reminds us that so can we. In fact, so shall we, the people that, that are His. The resurrection confirms that God has accepted what Jesus did and it gives us that true hope that eternity is a reality, that there is life after death. And then after His, his death and, and resurrection and as, ascension, Jesus sent us His Holy Spirit, God present in us. You know, the purpose, the deposit that, 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 that we are given, the Holy Spirit being in us is a guarantee of our ultimate salvation. That presence of God in us, His love and His empowerment, God living, us, linear, God living in us and, and guiding us in life, that, that is empowerment. And this is the gospel. This is the gospel. A gospel that is bearing fruit throughout the world. It's a gospel that takes effect through our faith. And it's a faith that is real, a faith, a faith that expresses itself. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Believe, believe. As we acknowledge Jesus, both as Savior and Lord, the truth of the gospel becomes sure and becomes ours. And we receive everything that is being promised that has been mentioned, the promises of the gospel, that very sure reward. And as we are told in verses 13 and 14, we have been moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the sun, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of righteousness. And we praise God, praise God that the gospel does continue to bear fruit. It's not something that just happened in the past. Even as people in the present days, you know, I hear people saying, you know, uh, the, the Christian church is not growing enough. There's, you know, I want to tell you that the gospel continues to bear fruit. It grows through us as we understand God's grace. You know, by yesterday afternoon, we've, we've been having our, our, church, our church at Kabuku, our Kabuku campus, has been having a weekend outreach. And by yesterday, 3 p.m., I haven't got the details from last night, but by yesterday, 3 p.m., they had reached 143 people on one-on-one -on -one and, and personal conne connections, and 21 decisions for Christ had been recorded. The gospel bearing fruit. In fact, every week, one of the things that has been happening in our staff prayer meeting is reports of new people coming to the Lord, coming to faith. Every week we're getting those reports. You know, Pastor Patricia, who takes care of our children, had some of us praying during this week as she was walking with a lady that she was praying with and, and walking with and talking with, hoping that this lady would come to faith. And we've been praying her for this week. And yesterday, she accepted the Lord. She has become part of the family of Jesus Christ. The Lord's work is continuing to bear, the gospel continues to bear fruit. And when one looks at the, at the statistics, you know, the bigger numbers, the gospel is growing amazingly in Africa, in South America, in the global south. It's huge growth. And we are going and reaching out into those places where people are thinking that the gospel is sort of dying out in the West. And new people are going there and, and the gospel continues to bear fruit. So faith, love, hope, these three things, be giving thanks for them the gift that God gives us in the gospel. In verse 7, it refers to Epaphras as a faithful minister for Christ in our behalf. And, and in the end of chapter 1 and beginning of chapter 2, Paul gives his own testimony about, about his ministry and the things that are motivating and, and how he's being empowered by God to be a minister. It's a picture of what a faithful minister looks like. And it's something that we'll be looking at in two weeks' time. So moving on to, to verse 9. We come to Paul's prayer for the Christians. After the thanksgiving comes the request. 
The prayer is given in verse 9, and its essential request is for God to establish us as true disciples, people who are truly following Jesus Christ. So verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So the request is that, you know, God will fill us with, with knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And why does, why does Paul pray this? What is the result of us knowing God's will, of having this spiritual wisdom and understanding that comes from the Holy Spirit? The result is a life that is lived in true knowledge of God's will. It's a powerful and a fruitful life, a life that is worthy of the Lord. Verse 10, and we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way. This is what happens as we, as we understand God's will. How, how do those things work out? How do we please Him? Firstly, we are bearing fruit in every good work. Our lives, the actions that we do, the things that we are doing in life are fruitful for God. They make a difference. Secondly, we are growing in the knowledge of God. We are experiencing Him more. We are knowing Him better. We are becoming better people in God, um, in our relationship with Him. Thirdly, you know, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. By the way, it doesn't sound as if it's going to be easy. Eh? The, life, the life that we are talking about is not, is not going to be, be so easy. I remember Paul himself had these kind of challenges of his life, but, but God had produced that strength and endurance. And in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 to 13, he says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And he could have added here, of course, whether in prison or released from prison, whether facing floggings or going through shipwrecks, we all know the, the kind of things that Paul went through and still remained able to have something that comes from the inside. And he says in verse 13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. There is a strengthening that we have when we gain this wisdom and knowledge of God's will. And then the fourth thing, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. You know, we do not take for granted what what God has given to us, a glorious gift of becoming an heir to the true kingdom and a glorious gift of becoming God's heir. You know, some translations, by the way, they link that joyfulness to the previous item, to having joyful endurance and, and patience. And that should be the case. There's a sense in which if our joy is coming from the inside, that we should be able to face the challenges we are facing with joy. However, NIV links it to the thanksgiving which also makes sense, which makes sense because any genuine thankfulness is going to be linked with joy. If you're truly thankful, if, you're, if you really feel this is making a difference in your life, it's going to give you joy. And the result of this prayer, you know, the prayer for knowing and understanding God's will, the, the prayer for spiritual wisdom and, and spirit-inspired wisdom and knowledge is the means to have a successful kingdom life, a successful life as a son, as a daughter of the most high God. To live a life that is worthy of God, worthy of the calling that he has, he has given to you, worthy of it, the life of his son who was crucified for you. Is this a prayer that we ought to be praying? Who should we be praying for? I hope that you're going to be praying for yourself, isn't it? These things that will become a reality in your life. I hope that you'll be praying for other believers. You know, why would you complain about so-and-so is not walking right with God and is not living a life that is worthy of being a Christian? Pray for her. Pray for him. In fact, you know, pray. We cannot live for the king successfully without the king working in and through us as our partner. But the good news is that his presence with us his enlightening of our lives, his giving us wisdom and understanding. All of these things are only a prayer away. Because you see, Paul and Timothy are praying God's will. God wants us to understand him. He wants us to know him better. He wants us to understand his will and purpose for our lives. And so once we are praying these kinds of prayers, praying in accordance with God's will, we know that we will have those prayers answered. You know, the prayer room is the engine room for us as Christians. 
Are you praying? Are you praying? What are you praying for? What are you praying about? Who are you praying for? What do you pray for that person? Is it only comfort? Is there something more that you, that you want to pray for? Do you pray in community, gathering together with other Christians? Because there's something powerful that happens when we gather together and, and pray in community. You know, Paul gives us a wonderful example of, of some of what we ought to be praying. God-centered prayers. Prayers that reflect God's desires for the lives of his people. And, and, and we will find many, many prayers like this in his, in his letters. And I pray that we will learn to pray like this, that we would live it out and, and we would learn to desire to become the kind of disciples that God is desiring. So that we, as we pray, it is the path, it is the direction of our lives. So faith, love, and hope. That's a good reason for thanksgiving. And we thank God that empowering for successful kingdom living, empowering for, for us to become true disciples is only a prayer away. And we can be praying like I want us to pray right now. So will we, will we just bow down and pray? Um, Father, I just, I just thank you so much for, for this community, these people that are here today. Father, I know that many of us, including myself, we are believers. Most of us are believers. And Father, I just want to be together with them right now and just say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for, 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 for faith, for love. Thank you, Lord, for hope that we are living life in this world with a very sure path forward. That we have something that, that cannot be lost because it comes from the Creator Himself. Thank you, Lord, for, for just the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ and living in His will. Father, thank you for the grace that you continually give to us and your desire for us, your desire to make us great people, wonderful people, people that truly fit the path that you are calling us to. And so we pray for this as well. We ask, Lord, that, that you will help us, that you will help us to have true knowledge of your will, that we will have true spiritual wisdom and understanding. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit who enables us to truly live out the things that you, that you, that you call us to, the things that you have laid um, on our hearts because you're the one who is the person calling us to a path. We pray, Lord, that you will make us a fruitful people, a really fruitful people, that we will be a people that grow in our knowledge and experience of our great God as we walk together with you. That, Lord, you will strengthen us so that our lives are filled with the power that comes from you and that we are not dependent on external circumstances for life, but we have internally the power of God enabling us to deal with things, with patience, with endurance, dealing with challenges of joy and sadness and, and able to live in all of those challenges, fully secure, fully founded on the God of our creation. And Lord, we, we pray that, that truly you will be stirring in us through that knowledge of all that you've done, a joyful thanksgiving because you've given us so much that you will stir in us a joyful thanksgiving and that ultimately our lives will be lived worthy worthy of your son on the cross worthy of 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 your calling and your grace towards us worthy of of our, your calling us to heaven help us lord to live lives that bring you true joy true true joy and father i pray right now for those who are here today and having heard the gospel might be saying they want to embrace it if you are here today and you desire to embrace the gospel i invite you to come into the family of jesus christ and speak to him, speak to him and just tell him, tell him that you are a sinner. Tell him, I am a sinner. Just say my prayer. I am a sinner, Lord, and I recognize it. But I truly am thankful that you are a gracious God, that you sent your son to die on the cross. And I receive his penalty. I receive his payment, the payment that he has taken on my behalf. And I thank you that you are calling me into a new life. Oh Lord Jesus, come into my life. Make me new and take me forward into the future. Thank you for making me a member of your family. Embed me in the, in the family of Jesus Christ as I walk together with other Christians. 
But I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.